not much warmer in here. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Start off with this, do a little kind of basic rundown. I mean, microscopes up here. It's not going to work for me. Do you even use those? I imagine that's for viewing, projecting a view. I, I'm assuming that he uses them for his like slides for his blood smear. Dr. Sherry, yeah. I don't know. Maybe they're better than the ones I have next door. The one I have next door is so blurry. Get it. Okay. All right. So chapter five. Chapter five is dealing with the eukaryotes. And um, so the big main differences with the eukaryotes, of course, is going to be the fact that we have a, a membrane bound nucleus, but not just the membrane bound nucleus, but also the membrane bound organelles. So it's not as simple as just saying that I am recording this, right? That would kill me if I was like not actually recording this. Yes, I am. Okay. Um, membrane bound organelles. Uh, so that's the biggest difference there. And we're going to start there. And so I think um, basically breaking down what the, I have my handwriting. Um, what the organelles are, the main, main ones that we need to know anyways. Mitochondria, these are our um, powerhouse of the cell. So this is where all the energy is made. And um, so that's membrane bound and it's going to have its own little spaces and folds and whatever. So the folds inside the mitochondria are the cristae and the space in between. It's called the matrix. And the biggest deal for the my the um, eukaryotes is going to be that this is the site of aerobic respiration. Um, which, of course, we're going to get into when we review chapter 10. But um, aerobic respiration for us, of course, means ATP generation, which is our biggest source of energy. Um, and since we are talking about the, mito the uh, eukaryotes, we should probably mention the fact that um, the great, great, great grand majority of them being aerobic, um, they're going to rely on oxygen. Of course, the whole reason they need that is for their final electron acceptor on the electron transport chain, which we'll get into in chapter 10. But hey, that's the idea of what the mitochondria is for. Uh, let's see, next we have the electron. I mean, I'm going to add this since it's on the study sheet, which seems kind of unfair now looking back on it. <laughs> But I put that, but whatever. What do you mean? Like, because uh, on my study sheet, chapter five, uh, for the unit one study sheet, chapter five, when you look at mitochondria, it says interfolds called the cristae, site of aerobic respiration, and the electron transport chain, which serve to form um, energy rich ATP, which is fine if you leave that statement just there okay, as it is. What am I? What are, we, what are you looking at? The study sheet for unit one. Yeah. The study guide or the study? the study sheet. So let me see, let me see, let me see. The one that's at the very top of unit one in the unit one module. Yeah, but I mean, I guess my point really being that like, yes, you do. Now you need to know what the electron transport mm -hmm. chain is and everything. But at the time of 
me having written this, that is something we hadn't even gone over yet, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but that really is it for, for the mitochondria. That was an easy, that's what's an easy one, especially now, now that we have been introduced. Some of this stuff, looking back on it, seems easier now and that, that you guys have been applying it for a while, I'm sure. Endoplasmic reticulum is my next one. So the endoplasmic reticulum is the site of protein um, production, other molecule production as well. So the rough version, the rough ER, this is where we're going to have ribosomes. Studying the membrane of it, uh, and it is the site of protein production. And I will say that um, when you're making proteins um, using your ribosomes, of course, there's a term for that, and that term is translation. Okay, and then the smooth, the reason it's smooth is because it lacks the ribosomes, of course. Um, and this is where we're going to have protein modification, adding on groups to the proteins, uh, lipid production, stuff like that. Okay, so making our non protein. Okay, uh, the next one I have on here is the Golgi apparatus. I don't really have a whole lot to say other than it's for packaging. Let's just say packaging your products that you made in the ER. And then uh, the nucleus, oh, I have chloroplasts on here too, chloroplasts. And we know chloroplasts, these guys are, I don't know if I break them down, I don't really, I just say that they're side of photosynthesis, which is nice, because I don't care that much about the, the <laughs> structures inside of that. So this is photosynthesis. So primarily concerning photosynthesis um, whenever we are exposing sunlight, so say light plus pigment um, will drive formation of that proton gradient. And then that will lead to ATP production, which is later on used in uh, the dark reactions, if you want to call them dark reactions, um, to make glucose for plants. So that's how basically that will work, just to reprise some stuff that we learned back in the good old days. A lot of this stuff leading up back into those concepts from chapter 10. You know, dark reactions because they're taking a lot of energy and then they, they do most of their metabolism at night, right? So um, it's dark because it doesn't require light. So it's so the other ones absolutely require. So right before that, that light interacting with the pigment, we make that proton gradient and we make a little bit of ATP. That requires light. So that's um, the actual true light reaction for photosynthesis. Then once you have that little bit of ATP, you can use that ATP whether there's light or not. So that's why they call it the dark reaction because it's light. Really the true, probably better way to word it would be the light independent reaction. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and that was something like when I remember when I was learning this in um, biochem, why is this, okay, whatever, that piece was fine. 
when I learned this in biochem, I learned it as the dark reaction. And then I ended up getting confused because I thought that it had to happen in the dark, but it's just light independent. Okay, so those are the organelles. Um, it also has a membrane-bound nucleus. And of course, if we're going to be talking about the nucleus itself, this is going to be the location of the genetic material. The location of the chromosome. So for the eukaryotes, there's always more than one. Well, I, you know, I'd say more than one, but there's greater than one uh, chromosome. Bacteria typically only have one chromosome, and it is um, for bacteria, it would be circular and one chromosome. Ours are linear, and we have more than one. Linear. Bacteria don't call, is it a different name, or is it still called chromosome? We can still call it a chromosome. Um, they have our, their chromosome. It's one chromosome. It is a circular chromosome. And they can also have uh, other like extra DNA like in the plasmids. Yes. That's what I figured you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the, they'll be extra if they're, if they're that. I do want another thing that I will have sometimes uh, I realized early on when I was teaching this course is that um, reminding that the plasmids are much smaller than the chromosomes whenever bacteria do have them. They're, they're just literally just extra DNA. So, okay, so this is the basic um, layout of those membrane-bound organelles that the eukaryotes have. None of the bacteria have any of this. Um, Okay, there are some other structures that I want to add on before I move on to the next topic um, that are not membrane bound necessarily, but are still important. And that is, first of all, we have the flagella. Similar concepts to the flagella uh, for the bacteria. The bacteria, so I will say this, bacteria When they're in their flagella, they're, theirs will rotate in like clockwise or counterclockwise. And they're just like little bits of protein hanging out outside. Um, in the eukaryote, they have a whip like motion and they are membrane covered. Um, the other structures that I want to kind of mention. So either way, these are both, you want to say for locomotion, some movement. So number two um, is cilia, which is something that bacteria don't have. Bacteria don't have that, and that the eukarya will use for locomotion, as well as feeding to kind of help like move their environment around, like like water or something, flush it into their mouths or whatever it is. Um, and then the last thing was the glycocalyx. Where we know for bacteria, they use that for their capsule or their slime layer. Um, so let me put this like, let me give myself some more space here. Okay, whatever.
So if we're using it for capsule, we can use it for attachment or, or it is also helpful to evade phagocytosis. For the eukaryotes, they use this as their extracellular matrix. So it's just all of the stuff that helps hold the cells to one another as well as allow for movement. I really did shatter this screen protector. At least it's a screen protector and not the all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, I think that's yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. So that is our kind of organelles and structures for that. Let me get another page. Okay. So this next part, we have some, I feel like this next page is kind of a random one, but it is what it is. I will talk about uh, mitosis. So when we talk about bacteria, whenever they multiply, they uh, do this thing where they'll become like one cell and then they'll kind of just stretch themselves out to become an equal set of two cells. And then this process is called binary fission. In mitosis, you don't necessarily have to have this equal splitting up going on, but you will make sure that your contents are equal, at least as far as making sure everybody has chromosomes and the parts that they need. But we've even seen how like in yeast, whenever you bud, you have maybe even budding off of like a much smaller shaped cell that will be popping off the edge of that original one. Um, and then it'll grow in size as it needs to after it buds off. So that's kind of how um, that's going to be working. So this process that we go through to go from a progenitor cell to make the two daughter cells it doesn't have to be necessarily equally shaped or anything like that. That is our mitosis. And this is um, what we will be going through in our somatic cells. This is not for reproduction, not for sexual reproduction. I should add that sexual. If you are trying to make cells for sexual reproduction, then that is called meiosis. So sexual reproduction gamete formation equals meiosis. Just so that we're clear, that's a completely different thing. Okay, so through mitosis, the way that I remember it, and that like is easy to remember, is P mat. The puppy goes P on the mat. <laughs> Oh, that's how Dr. Shear says it. Mat. Yeah, <laughs> be on the mat. So this will be the prophase. Um, so in, in the prophase, we're gonna have our like mixed up mess of chromosomes being condensed into those X's, like we're used to seeing them in um, in those images where you know karyographs or something like that for karyotyping, but and whatever you'll have all of your chromosomes lined up and doubled up and matched up and whatever so we're going to condense all of that i can't write today chromosome condensation and then we have um the spindle fiber fiber formation as well And the spindle fibers are just going to help guide the chromosomes. Uh, 
Okay, M is metaphase. Metaphase is a pretty straightforward one. It's just where we're going to be lining up our chromosomes in the middle using those spindle fibers. So it'll look kind of like this. I don't know why I always draw it weird, but yeah, you know, like that. And then the spindle fibers will be dragging on it um, like this. A is anaphase. So now we're going to be pulling those X's apart. So if you have your cell and you had your X that was right above in our metaphase, now we're gonna start pulling those parts away from each other. Um, actually, let me be more specific with those. So those parts, those doubled up chromosomes, the whole reason they look like an X is that one half of that X and the other half of that X are exact copies of one another. One side's gonna go to one cell and the other side's gonna go to the other cell so that they have the exact same genetic stuff. And um, so these are called sister chromatids. So here we are going to pull apart those sister Those sister chromatids and remember those are exact copies of one another. Um, and then in the telophase, here we're going to have uh, really just forming the new cells. I'm not going to split apart the cells and, and form new ones. All right, so that is essentially how mitosis works. Well, pretty quick and easy. All right, next, let's move on to the fungi. These are a group of the eukaryotes. Um, so this includes not just typical like mushrooms and stuff like that, mushrooms and molds and yeasts. Okay, let's see, let's see. And um, we do not have any chloroplasts. These guys are not photosynthetic, not truly, but they do have um, cell walls. These can be made of cellulose or chitin. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this includes things, yeah, we already said this. I'm gonna go ahead and add up here though, that these can be saprobes or um, opportunistic pathogens. So we'll remember that a saprobe is an organism that breaks down um, dead and decaying material. And then that stuff is called detritus or detritus, however you like. All right, and then what does someone say? Opportunistic pathogen just takes advantage of your, you know, lowered immune system or its situation being somewhere that it doesn't belong, something like that. Uh, term for fungi, the mycelium. The mycelium is the part of the uh, fungi that exists of the mass of the hyphae. And the hyphae, of course, we have to know what that is and understand that. The hyphae are those hair-like fibers 
that make up like mold. So if you think of like furry looking mold, the individual little hair like structures are the hyphae and that overall structure is the mycelium. Um, spores. <laughs> This is for um, asexual reproduction. They can also make spores that are specific for sexual reproduction, but we don't really get into that too much in this chapter. So we'll just worry about it being for whatever, reproduction. So spores are for reproduction. Um, we have two different kinds of structures they can form for this. Sporangiophores and conidiophores. I mean, these aren't too complicated. Really, the only thing that you need to know about is that the sporangiophores are the covered. And the conidiophores, these are the structures that we were um, looking at uh, whenever we looked at the Aspergillus and the penicillium in our lab and that one where we had that question about what structures are you looking at basically of that and those were the conidiophores of the penicillium in the image but um, so those are conidiophores so those are open so we can think of this as looking like like a little ball and a bunch of spores inside of it if we were sporangiophores and then the conidiophores being almost like um, either like a dandelion, or you could even have it look like a paintbrush or whatever it is, but either way, they don't have a, like kind of a covering for them. So that's the differences here. Is that one I'm gonna talk about? It is <clears throat> Okay. Um, next we have the Protista um, group. Let's go. Let's do it. So for the protists, we have two groups that, um, two kind of, I guess you could split this into two, the algaes. So the, good, the thing about the protists in general is that these are, uh, do, do not form true tissues. So they might be groups of, or, of cells that kind of work together almost like a tissue, but they're not true tissues because they're not dependent on being working that way. So that's kind of everything that fell into that category got lumped into this. So that's going to be our algae. This includes um, kelp and plankton, photosynthetic plankton. Planks, plankton. Um, and then these guys do have uh, chloroplasts. And they also are like the major contributors um, yeah, of our atmospheric oxygen. Thanks to that um, photosynthesis. So we've got that. And... And then yeah, let's just move on to the protozoa because they're they're not that important as far as disease. They can cause like algal blooms and that can cause devastation, but that in and of itself is not really like true disease, like what we're interested in. So and let's move on to the protozoa. And we definitely know protozoa are going to be the important ones as far as pathogenicity goes. Um, these are going to be grouped um, with potentially the amoebas which moved by pseudopodia. Um, and then we have the flagellated guys. This would include things like Giardia, Lamblia. And um, we have the ciliated ones that have little um, appendages for feeding mostly, but that is also for locomotion. And then we have the AP complexes. They aren't able to truly 
um, look them out. So they are, don't have that ability, but they are all parasites. So that is medically relevant, at least now we know that about them. Um, but yeah, uh, one important thing to be aware of with these is that um, we do have um, a couple things to know about the protozoa. They can go through a similar cycle to endospore formation. Um, but in this case, uh, they're going to go between the trophozoite and the cyst forms. So the trophozoite is the free living form, swimming, eating, everything like that. And the cyst is that hardy, more dormant, protective form. Pretty good, happy. All right, finally, uh, we're gonna get down to the helmets. Uh, I guess we can just kind of uh, group these up as roundworms or flatworms. So these are all going to be our parasitic worms. And they are all multicellular. They have mouth parts and organs and all that sort of stuff. So first uh, we could say we have the round worms. You watching the- I didn't let you do that. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> so the round worms here. I'm sorry. So the helmets, it, we've got, that's fine. They have their own little term. They're the roundworms are known as nematodes. I don't know why I was thinking of like the, I think of um, Nemo, Captain Nemo. I guess you could think of Nemo like the, the fish. That's not usually what I think of. I think of Captain Nemo in 10,000 Leagues Under the Sea or whatever. So 10,000? It's 10,000. I don't know. <laughs> it's Jules Verne. Um, anyways. Yeah, you're fine. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so we got the brown worm. So this will include things like, and we'll get into some of these diseases when we're getting into chapter um, 23, but um, this will make more sense. But then we'll have things like Ascaris, falling into that. So Ascaris lumbricoides, the giant intestinal roundworm, those would fall into that. Um, next, uh, the flatworms. Okay, and so the flatworms, they're going to be called platyhelminthes. I like that word quite a lot. And then, um, yeah, these these ones are good. These are going to divide up into the flukes, into the tapeworms. The flukes are called the trematodes. Yes. And then the tapeworms are called the cestodes. And that's just some fancy words that we get to learn about in this chapter. We don't really learn much about the helmets too much until we start getting into the diseases that they cause, which I think is more important aspect about them anyways. But um, we will be talking about, of course, I guess we already do, we already have um, some study guide stuff about like the medications that help treat some of this stuff. But since it's only just, it's just two that apply that we have to know about for the helmets. Um, that's the praziquantal and the ivermectin.
so that we can divide it up that way. Okay. So that's the basic rundown for what we have for the study sheet. And so now I'm going to switch over to uh, the uh, the slides I made to just review over some more open question mm -hmm. concepts. Share screen thing. That's why. <clears throat> what? That's why the agar, the gram negative, grew so wide. It's known for its swarming motility. Oh, yeah. What's, uh, which one did you make again? Yeah, that's exactly right. It is known for that. And I should have known better than to. That was the only one that I got to grow well in the very beginning. And that's the one that, remember how I give everybody like all the same plates at the beginning? And I was like, everybody has the same one because this is what I have. It was that. And it like overgrew yeah, everything. You can, you can <laughs> I should have known better, but it was the only one that grew well. So, okay. So let me switch to this. All right. Okay, that's cool. It's named after the Greek god who changed shape to avoid capture. That's just, oh, that makes sense. That's yeah. Really cool. This is cool. All right. So starting off with this, this is how I usually um would used to do my summer sessions because I didn't see them, you know, so fast eight weeks that they have to do all of this stuff. So we had um a study review every single week. And so this is how I would give it to them. I'd have a bunch of questions and we'd go through them. But the defining feature of eukaryotes. So what's the defining feature of eukaryotes? We know that is going to be the fact that they have a um, membrane bound nucleus. That's the more important thing, right? But also it's all of their, they have organelles. All of them are going to be membrane bound. So that's important too. Cilia and what are they for? Um, they're for locomotion. They're little tiny hair-like appendages on the outside of the cells, but they're for locomotion as well as for feeding. So like filter feeding. Um, do eukaryotes have cell walls? Some of them do. So things like plant cells, which we didn't talk much about, but they do. Um, and the uh, molds, they can have cellulose or chitin cell walls. So, yeah. What molecules provide rigidity to eukaryotic cell membranes? The membranes of the eukaryotic cells are going to be either provided with rigidity from a cell wall if they have it. If they don't have a cell wall, then they're going to have sterols like cholesterol. Um, which we mentioned a little bit with the mycoplasmas in the bacteria chapter, but it's very prominent in eukaryotes. Our own cells, for example, sterols. Um, the nucleolus, is it found in prokaryotes or eukaryotes? What's its function? What is a nucleolus? A nucleolus, again, is a region of genetic information. So remember in the bacteria, they have a region of their chromosome where it just chills. That's, their, that's called the nucleoid region. Um, we have a true nucleus, so it's like take that nucleoid, but wrap it in, in, in a membrane. But within that, we have an area where we're making quite a lot of um, RNA. It's mostly for ribosomal RNA to make ribosomes so we can make protein. Um, and that's the, nu the nucleolus. It's just an area where we have a lot of that going on. Um, true or false, mitosis is exactly like by bi uh, bacterial binary fission. That's false. We know that there, there are a lot more steps involved, and there's like you know, chromatin separation and all of this stuff. So it does differ. And the steps of mitosis, we just went through those. So I'm not going to go through those again, the PMAT thing. Um, and then the purpose of the checkpoints in the cell cycle, which we didn't just go through, but there are checkpoints at certain areas of the cell cycle, whether we're making our copy of our um, DNA, our replication, or it's at certain steps within um, or before or after mitosis. No matter what it is, we have to go through checkpoints to make sure that everything's being duplicated the way that it's supposed to. And that helps us avoid things like cancer and um, mutation and things like that, make sure everything's been repaired how it needs to. Um, what is the difference between the rough and the smooth ER? The rough ER has ribosomes that are gonna be doing translation on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth ER is going to be doing protein modifications, but also potentially making other molecules besides proteins. 
the Golgi apparatus is the structure, membrane bound structure in the cell that is for packaging a lot of the stuff that's made by the ER. Um, what is the difference between a lysosome and a vacuole? The lysosome and the vacuole are both going to be structures that are membrane bound. Vacuole typically is just for storage, a lot of times just for water or food for the cell, but the lysosome has ingredients added in that are for killing um, organisms whenever we phagocytose them. So, you know, it's going to have lysozyme as well as toxic oxygen products and other enzymes and acid and stuff like that. Um, what purpose does the mitochondria serve and its evolutionary traits? So the purpose of the mitochondria is to make our energy in the form of ATP. We do that via um, the aerobic um, respiration steps of glycolysis um, and Krebs and um, that, uh, I guess, thank you, electron transfer chain. <laughs> it's okay. My brain doesn't always work. So, uh, but that that's basically how that mitochondria is going to be um, working for us doing all that. What evolutionary traits does it possess? What it's referring to with this question is just simply that it has its own chromosomes that uh, has one chromosome, one big circular chromosome like bacteria would have. It has its own ribosomes that are like bacterial ribosomes, and it has a double membrane, and it's everything in there to indicate that it used to be a bacteria at some point, which um, is pretty interesting when you think about it. Was which one was ADS? Was that mitochondria or ours? Or our for the ribosomes, the weight of it was eighty. I believe is ours. I think ours is eighty, and there's a seventy. I don't know. Remember enough about the Svedberg units, but. I, Good news is I won't ever ask you about that, of course, but um, yeah, I think so. I know ours is bigger. So if ours is bigger than bacteria, archaea also have the bigger one. So that's interesting. I know, right? There's so much that's different about archaea. It's like they're a whole other thing, but it's kind of hard to fathom if I'm being honest. Um, but yeah, so that's mitochondria. So true or false, if you have chloroplasts, you don't need mitochondria. That's false for sure. Yeah, we know about that in chapter 10. If you guys remember anything about it, that I'll tell you that um, the whole point of the um, chloroplast is to get that ATP, to, a little bit of ATP to make the uh, glucose that you're going to shove into the um, mitochondria, basically, to get your real ATP out of it. So that's the whole point. Yeah. Um, what, what kingdom do yeasts belong to? Yeast belongs to um, the fungi. So that's domain eukarya, but um, it's going to be the kingdom of fungi. Uh, compare and contrast hyphae and mycelium. So this is just asking us to remember that hyphae are like the hair-like structures and the mycelium is the overall structure of the mold. Um, what are the three major possible nutritional sources for fungi? Um, we had the saprobes that are going to break down the dead and decaying things. We had the opportunistic pathogens. And then we have the ones that are going to be just true extras heterotrophs. They're not going to be anything pathogenic about them, but they're not breaking down dead things either. So that's just the other category. Um, compare contrast sporangiospores and conidiospores. So this is actually ending in spores, but sp sporangiospores are the spores that come from the sporangiophores, which are those structures that are covered to contain the spores whenever you are a sporulating um, fungus and the conidia spores are the spores that are going to be um, given off by the uncovered conidia fours that are like the paintbrush ones and, and the um, the ones that look like that. So open conidia fours, closed sporangia fours. The spores are the spores that are coming from those structures. Um, true or false, algae-based plankton are responsible for the majority of the Earth's oxygen. Um, are algae Fungi, or are they protista? And they are protista, yeah. Which uh, group of protozoa are non-modal and are all parasitic? Um, that's gonna be the AP complexins. And I asked about that one simply because that we have so many that fall into that category that are important parasites, um, but it includes things like malaria. So that's definitely something that um, goes a little un unappreciated in America where we don't have that as a problem, but it's a massive problem throughout most of um, tropical and subtropical world. Uh, which group of protozoa are, oh, I already said that. Uh, what are the two types of helminths and their phylum names? Um, which do tapeworms and flukes belong to and what are their class? Um, so we kind of went over these, these, are these terms that we, we so lovingly like to refer to our helminths as. But <laughs> yeah, the roundworms um, are the nematodes and the flatworms are the platyhelminthes. The flukes are the trematodes, 
um, the tapeworms are the cestodes. All right. All right, so the first question that I have, um, kind of open-ended, summarize the endosymbiotic theory and explain how it accounts for major structural similarities and differences between bacterial and eukaryotic cells. So this is coming back to that concept of the mitochondria and how it has its own genetic information. Uh, chloroplast is the same way. It has its own genetic circular um, genome. They have their own ribosomes. They divide separately from those cells that they reside within and all of that stuff. That's the endosymbiotic theory that those may have at some point been bacteria that lived inside of those, um, what eventually became eukaryotic cells. Yeah, they got endocytosed. So it's sort of like phagocytosis, but they became one with the host. So it became useful, a beneficial relationship. I'm trying to see if I'm missing anything. Yes. All right, um, compare and contrast the structure and function of the following between bacteria and eukaryotes, ribosomes, flagella, glycocalyx. So we talked a little bit just a second ago about the ribosome, about how um, we've got bigger ones, um, different sizes really is the more important thing, bigger ones in the eukaryotes and the archaea um, versus the, the um, bacteria, but they're, they have the same function really other than that. Um, the flagella, we said about how the flagella, we have the whip-like motion with the membrane covered with like moving one for the eukaryotes, whereas it's going to move clockwise or counterclockwise rotationally as a protein structure, yeah, for the bacteria. And then the glycocalyx is the sugar coating. Um, bacteria, it's going to be your capsule or and or your um, slime layer for adhesion or phagocytosis ev uh, evasion. Um, and then for the eukaryotes, we have that as part of our um, extracellular matrix. But Question about the flagella. For bacteria, they, they, they do runs and tumbles, right? They just do their like turning and whatnot. For eukaryotes, do, can they intentionally like keep their head like yeah, straight? Yeah, they can direct their movement. Yeah. Because do, do they also use like clockwise slash counterclockwise movement with, with their flagella, or is it? Actual whipping. They could if they wanted to, but they don't have to since they can whip it, whip their flagella specific ways. They have more control over it and therefore can control their movement much more specifically and intentionally. So um, they're not as, you know, um, confined by that whole concept of like you can only rotate it one way and then you stop it and then that makes you hopefully turn a little bit this way. And then, yeah, so they're a little bit more controlled. That's a good question. Um, and yeah, so I talk about the extracellular matrix in the eukaryotes. I do want to be clear, there are single cellular eukaryotes, right, that don't have an extracellular matrix. They can still have um, capsule-like structures and stuff like that if they're single cellular. But since we're multicellular, that's what I usually always say. Um, okay, write a paragraph. And of course, I'm not going to make any, we have to break out and write a paragraph, but it is a good way of approaching this. Um, Illustrate the life of a protein from DNA to mature polypeptide and the course of its travels within the cell um, throughout its synthesis. So, of course, this is a much better question probably for the next review, but this at least gets you an idea of the structures of the cell that are going to be important for this. So if we're starting out in the actual um, nucleus as in a eukaryote, uh, starting out in the nucleus and um, as DNA and then making our RNA copy from that through transcription um, and then taking the RNA out to the rough ER and having the ribosomes out there translate it, um, making those um, amino acids be bound together by those peptide bonds as we're reading through that and then uh, making that uh, into a, maybe we might even say um, naive or, or whatever, uh, I don't know how else to describe it, immature, peptide, and then those pieces can come together with other peptides and form a true working enzyme. They might need modification. They might need, you know, um, sugar groups added to them if they are um, a glycoprotein or something like that. And that would all happen in the smooth ER, and we package them and move them wherever they need to through the Golgi apparatus. So that's the basic layout of how that would happen in the cell. As far as like the details of the actual transcription and translation of it, that's a great question for the next chapter, chapter six. Um, I guess not next. We do chapter five, seven first, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, you get it. Um, so I revisit that after we go through that one, but it's a great place to start really thinking about that stuff. Um, is it generally easier to cure bacterial infections um, from humans than protozoa 
it is, sorry, that's not meant to be a question. It is generally easier to cure bacteria than protozoa or fungi. Can you expect, can you speculate why that might be and what, um, based on what the cell type of each? So um, I already gave, put the answer up, I didn't mean to, but yeah, basically because the fungi and the protozoa have similar cell structure to us, they have membrane bound organelles that work the same way that ours do. It makes it harder to target those aspects of those cells, whereas bacteria, they have peptidoglycan. We don't have peptidoglycan and they have, you know, folic acid th synthesis. We don't have that. Those are great targets for bacteria. It's harder to find um, targets for protozoa and fungi that don't also harm our own cells. So that's really what the issue is. And like it says, that comes back to that concept of selective toxicity, which is just that term of trying to be toxic to the bad guy, but not harmful to the host. Okay, uh, question five asking, are fungal spores or protozoan cysts more similar to bacterial endospores and support your answers? We've gone over this a million times, but it's still a great one to review. Um, that fungal spores are for reproduction. They're happy, they're growing, they're already active. That's everything that has nothing to do with endospores, it has nothing to do with cysts. Protozoan cysts, however, are hardy and they're going to be better at surviving. They're going to be uh, dormant, they're going to be more similar to those hardy, dormant structures of the bacterial endospores. So protozoan cysts and bacterial endospores, very similar in structure, even in shape, they're generally round also, um, you know, have that protective coating on them to keep them um, secure and safe, whereas the fungal spores are um, in, only going to be made really in times of good, you know, uh, resources and health, and they're ready, they're happy, they're good to go. So it's kind of the opposite situation. So, yeah. All right. Um, question six. Oh, I, where's the question? Okay. <laughs> that wasn't what I was expecting. Yeah, it's not <laughs> um, so this picture, um, which of the groups in the picture um, contain a nucleus? So uh, this would just be asking us to go through this bacteria, archaea, eukarya, and if we were to look through each of these even and um, understanding how they fall within all of this stuff. So um, we can see here bacteria, and we should know that bacteria and archaea, neither of those have a nucleus. So this evolutionary tree is actually showing us that somewhere in here is the development of the nucleus um, to lead down to true eukarya. Um, but yeah, none of these guys have a nucleus. Um, so everything on the right does, and then we can even go through there and look and, and familiarize ourselves. So like, of course, we know that animals do, and fungi, we've just been talking about them. Plants, of course, they do. They're multicellular. If you're multicellular, you have to have a nucleus. Okay? If you're truly multicellular, um, uh, and then these other things like ciliates and flagellates and um, trichomonads and uh, microsporidia and diplomonids, things that I don't know actually a whole lot about, but have a whole lot to do with like early life actually, like when you look in like, um, like ocean life and stuff like that, these guys are pretty important for that. But, um, you know, entamoeba um, is fallen here in this category. We know about entamoeba um, being a, a, a protozoan that we're a little bit familiar with. And then slime molds, people often think that slime molds fall within you know, molds and they don't, they're in their own category within the eukaryotes. So, slime mold versus like mold mold? Yes. Yeah. So mold mold will fall with the Fungi. Is that the slime mold that's like intelligent, like can make its own like network? Yes. And stuff? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so that's just asking us to look back on that uh, evolutionary tree and, and see what we see with that and remind ourselves how it all falls together. So, all right, we have a case study here. Um, this is more applicable to um, what we're learning in these later chapters, but still kind of ties it all together. Uh, fecal accidents in the community swimming pool case study. <laughs> uh, during uh, June of 2000, several children in Delaware, Ohio, a city of Delaware, and were hospitalized at Grady Memorial General Hospital after experiencing watery diarrhea, abdominal cramps, vomiting, and loss of appetite. Dr. McDermott, a new um, gastroenterologist at GMH, who had, has also had a strong interest in infectious diseases, was asked to examine the children. Their illness lasted from one to 44 days. One to 44 days. <laughs> Can you imagine, man, if your kid was the one with the 44 and other people had the kids with the one day? <laughs> I'd be so mad. Um, nearly half of them complained of intermittent bouts of diarrhea. By uh, July 20th, 
over 150 individuals, mainly children and young adults between the ages of 20 and 40, experienced similar signs or symptoms. The doctor suspected that their illness was due to a microbial infection and queried the Delaware County City, the Delaware City County Health Department to investigate this mysterious outbreak farther. Um, Dr. McDermott helped the DCCHD team in surveying, in surveying individuals hospitalized for intermittent diarrhea. They questioned individuals about recent travel, their sources of drinking water, visits to pools and lakes, swimming behaviors, contact with sick persons or young animals, and the daycare attendants. The daycare attendants. Um, the investigation reported that outbreaks were linked to a swimming pool located at a private club in central Ohio. The swimming pool was closed on July 28th, um, I guess after they had linked it back to that. A total of 700 clinical cases among residents of Delaware County and three neighboring counties were identified during the entire span of the outbreak that began late June and continued through September. That's pretty crazy, actually. <laughs> That's a long time, a lot, 700 cases. And I mean, I don't know about you. I've been to like, I guess, public pools, but you don't think of like 700 people getting sick from going to a pool. At least five fecal. I can't with that part already. <laughs> I guess not. I guess not. Like junior lifeguard for a while, not a moment. I guess not. Yeah. I mean, I and I grew up going into public public pools, so I should know. But like, yeah, at least five fecal accidents were observed during that time period at the pool. Only one of these accidents was of diarrheal origin. Uh, only one of them was diarrhea. What? How breaks of gastrointestinal disease? I have read this before. I guess I never really read it like with my soul before. <laughs> Outbreaks of gastrointestinal disease, distress associated with recreation water activities have increased in recent years, with most being caused by the organism in this case. So, do you know what microorganism might be the cause of the outbreak? Endospore. <laughs> how can a single fecal accident contaminate an entire pool and cause so many clinical cases of gastrointestinal distress? So, great, really great guess, actually. Um, it's got to be an endospore, it, and it has to survive versus chlorine, which I imagine is going to be an endospore. Really? Yes. Yeah, so, this is great. So, this is great line of thinking. Um, the only problem, Daniel, is that this is the eukaryote chapter. So we know it's not endospore, but like, but still, the reason that I'm going to lean on that being a great guess is because we know that similar to endospores, protozoa have cysts, right? And they are yes. So okay. protozoa. So it's the same concept. It's the same exact concept as that. So you got it right. It's just the eukaryote version. So um, this is cryptosporidium. So cryptosporidium parvum um, is a protozoa. And it lives, it's actually pretty well renowned for surviving in chlorine. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just happen to know that because I know all about this stuff because I teach about it. But yeah, their cysts that they form are um, survive well in chlorinated swimming pools. So it just happened that we had someone who was um, infected or something and they um, got sick in the water and it got spread throughout all the other people that were swimming in the water and it survived the chlorination and all of that. So, they're very resistant to disinfectants. Um, cryptosporidium, you probably heard of cryptosporidium before and you didn't really, probably it's one of those things that just passes through your mind, but it is very real um, problem in swimming pools, especially. So um, we had over 30, 370,000 cases in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1993, 370,000, that is a ton. Um, that was the largest waterborne outbreak in history. Um, there was uh, human sewage containing the cysts. Um, they had pool associated contaminated drinking water illnesses, um, uh, oysters that were contaminated with the cysts as well um, that were leaked into the water that were nearby and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's cryptosporidium, man. Don't. Uh... Yeah. I don't know. Three, five nanometers and stuff. That's what it's nanometers. Micrometers, yeah. A little bit bigger, so, but still, you wouldn't see it with the naked eye, you know, so. So they're eukaryotes. I don't know, what is their size? What's the size of bacteria? It depends on bacteria, right? So, yeah, I don't know. Um, Off the top of my head, I'm not good with that stuff. But I think it's still pretty small comparatively um, to this particular cyst. But the cyst is a smaller... Yeah. 
uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, so anyways, interesting stuff. So there we go. There are some eukaryotes that are involved in illness. Um, the fact that they form cysts, the ooh, ooh, cysts, it's the same thing. It's just the way they refer to it. But um, that is what made them protected from that. So, yeah. so the oysters filtered it, but they kept the ooh, ooh, Yeah, and then people would eat the oysters. That's actually pretty common with oysters. If it's not cryptosporidium necessarily, oysters have a huge problem with Vibrio. Vibrio oh. is, yeah, like, like cholera, but not cholera directly. There's other kinds of Vibrio, but um, it's associated with basically water or seawater, but there is used to be an issue where they would pull oysters out of the ocean over by New York City, but there was so much, they were just jump, dumping sewage into the water out there. And so during certain times of year when the sewage would grow from the warmer weather, they, it was illegal to go farm oysters out there. Um, that's a yeah, so that's why it's still a concern now, Vibrio. though, to eat uncooked oysters because it can contain Vibrio. I could never, I could never get used to it. Oh. I've done it. Whenever my brothers do it, they'll, they'll, I'll eat with them, just slurp it up. Yeah, it's consistent. Yeah, I don't like it either. It's, I don't even really like the flavor. The only time that I like oysters is if I have like a lot of stuff that I put on it to help me <laughs> get yeah. it down. Yeah. 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 But anyways, that's it. That's all we got for this review. So do you have any questions though? Okay. That works. Awesome. That works for me for sure. Um, you know, of course you can always email me if you have any other questions and I will have this posted today sometime.